Hi, and welcome to the premier podcast of the Ultimate Movies Broadcast Show. This is Lorraine in Canada, one of your hosts, and I'm joined by my co-host from Sweden. Hi, Mats. Looks like we made it. For sure, Lorraine. The big day is here, and the podcast for the Ultimate Movies Broadcast Show has finally landed. I hear we got quite a fabulous first show. We certainly do, Mats. Peggy Diamond Levy and I will be discussing Mary Pickford and the Trenton Movie Studios of Canada. In the Hollywood Trivia Closet, we'll discover some surprising things about Errol Flynn. You'll be discussing a famous and unusual movie featuring actor Paul Henreid of Casablanca fame in your film noir segment. A great first show. Well, handshake across the Atlantic. Here we go. And now, on to our first segment, Short Bits, featuring up to the moment film news and more. Hi and welcome to Short Bits. Leading off our news for today is the story of the Canadian economy, our low dollar and the film industry. While sectors like oil and gas are suffering in the present true north economy, the low dollar has actually energized our Canadian film industry. Major centres like Toronto, Vancouver and to a smaller measure Halifax have seen a resurgence in film and television production. Toronto alone employs 25,000 experienced people. Pretty well half of this year's Academy Award nominees for Best Picture were filmed all or in part in Canada. Critic Richard Krauss, speaking with CTV Canada AM host Beverly Thompson in late January, revealed that much of The Revenant was filmed in Alberta. Brooklyn was filmed in Montreal in a section that resembled New York, and Spotlight was shot in Toronto, doubling for Boston. Pacific Rim and Crimson Peak were filmed up here as well, and director Guillermo del Toro has bought a house in Canada. Richard reported that the low loony also encourages Canadian production for American TV shows. The X-Files, re- the X-Files reboot was filmed in Vancouver, as were other series like The Flash and Once Upon a Time. As long as our dollar remains low against American currency, our film industry should thrive. In Memoria when you think of six-foot-four-inch Angus Scrim, you see him as the tall man, the spooky, gruesome character he first played in Phantasm in 1979 and its sequels. But his first screen appearance was in 1951 as Abraham Lincoln in an 18-minute short produced by the Encyclopedia Britannica Film Company. The short is included as a special feature on the Phantasm II Blu-ray release. Scrim actually was billed under his birth name, Lawrence Rory Guy as Lawrence or Rory in films and on TV before and after his phantasm success. Years earlier, as some sources state, it was while studying drama under William B. DeMille, brother of Cecil, at the University of Southern California that he invented his stage name, based on a relative's name and the technical term for a stage curtain, a scrim. He did have a career apart from the film world as a serious journalist and editor for mainstream publications like TV Guide and he worked nine years for Capitol Records, writing liner notes for singers with the label, including Nat King Cole, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, Dean Martin, Judy Garland, and Liza Minnelli. He won a Grammy Award in 1974 for Best Album Notes, Classical, for Korngold, the classic Eric Wolfgang Korngold, with the composer remembered for his film scores, and The Tall Man Lives On. Scrim, who had filmed his scenes about a month before passing away, will be seen again as his character in the final installment of the series, Phantasm Ravager, currently in post-production. Rest in peace, tall man Angus Scrim, born August 19, 1926, departing to join the brightly shining stars above on January 9, 2016. David Bowie, who passed away on January 10th of this year, clearly was a gifted and innovative singer, songwriter, and musician. Add acting into the mix, and you can safely consider that he was a genius at artistic pursuits. First showing up in the glam rock form on the last vestiges of the free love 1960s that morphed into the really do your own thing with as much free and freak style as possible in the 1970s, Bowie found creative freedom in a platform and in platform boots to create vital music from his soul. He was a singer and composer without apology. If you weren't hip enough to follow him, tough. Leaders don't linger. They climb and climb until they reach the peak of every revelation. If the melody and lyrics become popular, or a cult hit, that's a bonus. Bowie kept evolving, slightly ahead of what was on the playlist radio. He saw and rode musical trends well before style gurus could put names to the new waves. Ziggy played guitar 
and he would one day embrace his Lazarus experience. We remember him not as the main character in the World War II Japanese POW camp in Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, but as the soldier who kept his head bravely above the sand. He was the man who fell to earth, and now he is brighter than the black star in the night sky. He looked his scary monsters and super creeps of his illness straight in the eyes, and his sprite soul will always dance with the winged forces of his creativity forevermore in the serious moonlight. Rest in peace, Mr. Bowie. Barely four days after the passing away of David Bowie, the world again went into reeling shock with the news of the death of highly popular and beloved actor Alan Rickman on January 14th. Bowie and Rickman commandeered their deaths in similar style, with many close friends of both men not knowing that either was sick. Rickman especially seemed to revel in keeping his special secrets. He was the stalwart beau of his longtime girlfriend, whom he first met in 1965, and it was only in 2015 that he revealed he had married Rima Horton in 2012. They had lived together as a couple since 1977. Indisputably, Rickman was one of the most brilliant Shakespearean ilk actors to have come along in our time and he can be remembered for more than his noble and cryptic Harry Potter character, Severus Snape. Didn't he marvelously gnash his teeth as villains in films such as Die Hard, Robin Hood, The Prince of Thieves, and Rasputin? I will always consider it a mystery as to why Alan Rickman was never nominated for an Academy Award for any of his performances. Thankfully, he had been nominated by other highly respected film and arts organizations, and he received well-deserved recognition with 33 acting awards during his lifetime. Rest in peace, good sir. It was four days before the death of David Bowie that another hard-working star passed away on January 6th. Most people remember wonderful actor Pat Harrington for his role as Superintendent Dwayne Schneider on the sitcom One Day at a Time from 1975 to 1984. There was much more to Harrington, however, and a look back over his 60-plus years career reveals more to the man and his craft. A versatile, talented actor, including voiceover, he appeared in over 160 films and television series in starring and guest roles from 1949 to 2012. His very first TV appearance was in 1949 on the Ford Theatre episode One Sunday Afternoon, which also marked the television debut of Burgess Meredith. Between 2001 and 2010, Harrington was a co-star in the cast of ten different stage plays. He was honored with the Golden Globe in 1980 for Best Supporting Actor and a 1985 Primetime Emmy for Outstanding Supporting Actor for his work on One Day at a Time. Rest in peace, Mr. Harrington. And now a special short bit with Peggy Diamond Levy, with whom I'll be speaking later on in the show. Hi, Peggy. Welcome to our short bit segment. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine, Lorraine. How are you? Not too bad. My cold is clearing up. I hear you have some news about a possible major film festival with the involvement of TIFF to be held in Trenton in 2017. What's this all about? What is what is known so far and what is being suggested for funding such a major event? Well, this two gentlemen who founded the Toronto International Film Festival, I believe back in 1979, uh, were invited to come and, and, and talk, to have a look at the venue here and see if it might be possible to have an international film festival here in 2017. That would be the 100th anniversary of when the Trenton Studios opened, so it would be an appropriate time. So there was a committee formed, and the gentleman said that uh, the council would need to come up with a hundred thousand dollars and then from there you know they would be able to go ahead then they would look for additional funding i think they need about one and a half million to really get it off the ground but you know they we have high hopes that it's going to happen and in fact i picked up a little button the other day they and they're calling this event film street cinema on the trent it sounds wonderful. It isn't just going, the venues for showing the films are not going to be just in Trenton. They're looking, you know, at uh, Sterling, Napanee, this, this area. Sounds like the button is expressing a lot of faith there. Yes, I think so. Yeah. We're, we're wearing yeah. these, but we don't really know. The, the meeting, unfortunately, was canceled due to the weather oh. when the uh, council was going to address this to begin with. But it, uh, I think in another week, they meet the first and third weeks of the month, so I think next week they will be meeting again, and maybe they will have this on the agenda 
because there's a lot of interest. Has there been any talk maybe of uh, having a venue for another screening of Carry On Sergeant? That would sort of be... Uh, I think that would, yeah. I, oh, I think that would definitely come to pass yeah. because, you know, that was the big movie, the epic movie that was made here. So, yes, it's definitely part of it. So you, you'll have to keep us informed about oh, that, I Peggy. Uh, update us in, on a future show there. Okay, and, and thank you for being our guest today on Short Bits, and you'll be on again shortly with the interview later in the show. Okay, thank you so much, Lorraine. Finally, some Short Bits news. Comicbook.com reports that comic creator Stan Lee will be making a final Canadian public appearance. Lee, who is in excellent health at 93, told the Toronto Sun newspaper, I want to make a dramatic and not just another visit. If it's my last one, it means something. Lee's appearance at Fan Expo Canada takes place September 1st to the 4th, 2016 at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre. In other news, Val Kilmer will be making a return to the big screen in a cameo in Snowman, and he was recently in Oslo, Norway with co-stars Michael Fassbender and Kate Winslet for location shooting. Snowman is set to be released in October 2017. Kilmer has also been signed to play Iceman in Top Gun 2, currently in development. Lastly, there are quite a number of new movie releases nationwide coming up in March. Hitting theaters on March the 4th, London Has Fallen, Zootopia, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, and The Other Side of the Door. The Met, Menon Lescott, will see limited release on March the 5th. See our Show One podcast album on the Facebook page, The Ultimate Movies page, Silence to New Releases, for more info about upcoming films. Thank you, and we'll see you next month on Short Bits. Hi, this is Matt Bimbar from Sweden, here to share my thoughts with you about my choice for this week's film noir segment, The Scar. The Scar, released in 1948, is actually an almost perfect noir, definitely up there among the best, and there are a number of reasons for that. Let's first take a look at the characters. We have Johnny Muller, a gangster, intelligent and confident, but also crazy. The camera angle six minutes into the film let us know that. Johnny just got out of prison, but he immediately has a new plan, robbing a casino. We'll make 200 dough. That's a lot of money for just a minute's work. Johnny was one of those guys who went around. Good times, pretty girls. He was special. He never followed rules. There were no rules for Johnny. First comes him, then comes him, third comes him, and after that comes him. He's got big ideas and thinks he has a right to get away with murder. One who knows all that is Evelyn. Evelyn is a secretary and mistress to a psychiatrist. Evelyn doesn't get frightened. She walks around with an angry look on her face all the time, suspicious, always watching out. Why does Johnny like her? Her baby blue eyes, of course. And he doesn't have to walk on his head to get her. She's already a mistress to someone who looks just like him, Dr. Bartok. Well, except for the scar on Bartok's cheek. Both Johnny Muller and Dr. Bartok are played by Paul Henry. Evelyn, who is played by Joan Bennett, prefers the bad Paul Henry, Johnny Muller. Johnny's robbery of a mobster-owned casino goes wrong, and now he needs to hide. He even needs a new identity. Johnny thinks there is no one quite like him, but as far as looks goes, there is. Dr. Bartok. Well, except for the scar on Bartok's cheek. But Johnny can fix that. He simply kills Bartok and cuts himself on the cheek to get a scar just like Bartok's. What could go wrong? Well, that's the plot, the main characters. One thing that's always a great ingredient for a noir is irony. And oh, the irony in this one. At first things go pretty well for Johnny. Not even his own righteous brother Frederick realizes him. Well, first he thinks he does. That is, except for the scar on his cheek. Now, that's the fantastic thing about this film. Frederick doesn't think, hey, that's Johnny with a scar on his face. Oh no, because of the scar, he thinks it's definitely another person. But noirs can be far-fetched, it doesn't matter. Yes, things go pretty well for Johnny. Not even Bartok's wife gets suspicious. Charwoman does, but not the wife. Johnny starts chain-smoking, and that is enough to fool everyone. That plus the scar on his face. Yes, things go pretty well for Johnny. Maybe too good. Johnny is Bartok. Got it all now. 
all the irony in this one. Bill Noirs like to tell us that we can't escape fate. Not even Johnny Muller can. And on the way to Johnny's fate, we get to see a fabulous noir with almost an orgy of noir photo. That is another reason why this film is up there among the best, the photo. And how come the scar has such an amazing photo? The answer is John Alton. John Alton is always the answer when it comes to noir photo. Almost every scene stands out as a model example of how a film noir should look. The angles, the focus, the claustrophobic shadows, the light, and most of all, the darkness. Yes, John Alton is the answer. Paul Henry is really great as a villain. Cool on the outside, but with violence always lurking under the surface. A bit George Raftish, actually, which is very good in my book. And Joan Bennett, why, she's the ultimate noir actress. In fact, even if she really isn't a femme fatale in this film, you still think she is, because she's Joan Bennett. The Scar, also known as Hollow Triumph, is based on a novel of the same title by Murray Forbes. The screenplay was written by Daniel Fuchs, who also wrote the screenplay for Criss Cross and Panic in the Street. And it was produced by Paul Henry himself. It's a great little film, telling us that it's a bitter little world out there. Well, that's my take this week on a classic film noir. See you again next month for another review. Will it be another noir, a western, or a horror classic? I'll keep you guessing until next month. This is Matt saying goodbye for now. Welcome to the very first segment of the Hollywood Trivia Closet. This week's feature tale takes a peek back at Errol Flynn the Tasmanian hunk before becoming world famous. In 1933, Errol Flynn had made a brief splash as Fletcher Christian in Australia with The Wake of the Bounty, but he soon found himself looking for work off-screen. With the tough times of the Great Depression, a number of odd jobs helped pay the bills, and in an impulsive moment he also stole his mistress's diamonds. He dug wells for a while in Diamond Downs in Queensland, Australia's interior, and then he joined a mate to work 80 miles away on Stirling's Ranch, which could herd up to 100,000 sheep. Can you even imagine 100,000 sheep? For this job, Flynn found himself as second lowest man on the assembly line of gelding young rams. How exactly did this work, you may ask? Well, the first man had to clear away the mess from the ram's posterior. Flynn would then take the ram, hold it upside down, and with the precision of a surgeon, cleanly bite off its walnuts with his teeth. The procedure was commonly known to Australian farmers as dagging the boggets. By the end of the day, there would be quite a collection of Aussie prairie oysters. The job went without mishap for a while, although Flynn could never quite totally wash off or cover up the smell of he-goat completely. Admittedly, his dating life suffered a bit for that, yet he wasn't deterred long from seeking out a suitable filly, one closer to the scents hanging around the ranch. But Flynn couldn't balance the job with his love life. He was officially run off the ranch when the owner discovered him with one of his daughters in her bedroom. According to Flynn's autobiography, My Wicked Wicked Ways, while the owner went in search of a shotgun, Flynn grabbed his clothes and his hidden diamonds from that previous mistress and hightailed it. Not much later, a gold claim he'd once put in with a partner would be granted. But that's another story for another day. See you then, a month from now, with another tale from the Hollywood Trivia Closet. And now for our first feature interview for the Ultimate Movies broadcast show. I am honored to be joined by Canadian author Peggy Diamond Levy. A few years ago, we met at a local meet and greet, and she's written a few film-related books in addition to other biographies and fiction for young adults. Today, as author of Mary Pickford, Canada's Silent Siren, America's Sweetheart, she'll help us better understand who Mary was and how she helped shape the future of the film industry. Sometimes a person's destiny is just meant to be, you know, at the right time, at the right place, born under the right star in the universe. In the world of early cinema, Toronto, Canada's Mary Pickford star shone a bright path to her future, almost from the beginning. Her journey began with a providence of coincidence, when as a young girl her family boarded a stage manager of a theatre company in their home. Not much later, she would be on the stage, and then on her way to a spectacular Hollywood career she could never have imagined in her wildest dream. Hi Peggy, welcome to the Ultimate Movies broadcast show. I'm honoured to have you as our very first feature guest. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me, Lorraine. It, it's my honor. 
I had a great day yesterday. I presented Mary Pickford to the retired women's teachers of Ontario, uh, the Trenton branch, and I had a, a wonderful afternoon, and I showed her movie, The New York Hat, which is always a hit. Mary, it was made by Biograph in 1912 when Mary was 20, and a good demonstration of, of the way she was able to uh, emote, you know, uh -huh. uh, using subtle body language and just, yeah, it's always a hit. I try to show it whenever I present, uh, do a presentation on Mary because it's, it's short, and uh, but um, it's fun. It, it's, the people get a laugh out of it, too. It's a good introduction to her. Yes, it is, yeah. yeah. She's very young and still at that age where she's, you know, very beautiful. <laughs> Has a great sense of fun. Yes, it does. Yeah. Lionel Barrymore is in it with her. Oh, yes. And Lillian Gish, although I haven't ever been able to pick out Lillian Gish. She plays one of the shop women, and I just qu can't quite identify her. Th that was sort of very early on in Gish's own career. Yes, it yes. was. Yes. And her brother, um, Jack Pickford, was in it, too, playing oh. a youth. And it's so wonderful to be talking about Canada's first international cinema star, Mary Pickford. To begin, after a number of difficult years touring with plays, with her whole family working to keep body and soul together, Mary decided on a make-or-break for Broadway. She was an actress who wanted to start at the top, with Broadway top producer David Belasco, and she felt that to be an actress she had to be on the stage. But while on tour in Chicago, she discovered flickers and looked down on them. How did Mary's life change then, also with the influence of her mother? Well, her mother, um, Charlotte, had, had suggested to Mary that perhaps she would like to go and uh, try her luck at the Biograph Studios and to get into the movies. Well, as you say, she, she looked down on the movies. She was an actress, a Belasco actress, and she thought that, they, that the Flickers' uh, moving pictures were beneath her. But Charlotte convinced her that she could make a quick $5 a day, so she agreed to go and... Uh, Indeed, she got on with Biograph. In fact, she made a hundred short pictures with them in that year between 1909 and 1910 when she was uh, with them. It was also a way of keeping the family together. If she got into the flickers, the, the whole family could stay in New York City and not have to go home. They didn't want to be separated as a family either. Never. By 1912, Mary thought she was being passed over in roles in short films perhaps because of her age, but she was still young then. But regarding feature films, what happened in her career when moving on to famous players and some very early famous silent films? Well, I think famous players was probably the best uh, move that was ever made. Adolf Zukor was making feature-length films, and he had seen Mary in uh, a Belasco production on stage, and so he wanted to do that same show, uh, A Good Little Devil, uh, on the screen, and so he gave Mary a contract to sign, and yes, yeah, she, she described her years with famous players as the happiest years of her life. And was it with famous players uh, through Zucker that she had also um, made a deal that, that she did want to earn a little more money? Yes. Well, she was always doing that. Even <laughs> back in her biograph days, she wasn't happy with what D.W. Griffiths had offered her and, uh, you know, insisted on being paid more. He gave in to her, and the same with Zucor. And then, from this point on, like, Mary's fame grew, and she was considered to be an international personality, one of the world's first film superstars. What do you think was her special appeal as an actress? Well, the, the audiences just loved the feisty little independent tomboy that she always played, little Mary. That, that's what she made her, her name on in the beginning. But I think it was also the fact that she had somehow or other mastered the act of uh, her expressions, uh, you know, beautiful facial expressions, she emoted, and she convinced D.W. Griffith that she didn't need those exaggerated gestures that they used to use on stage because the audience was so much closer to the stars uh, on screen, and so they could, you know, they had to tone everything down a little bit. So Mary then was quite a, a an instinctive actress. Like she had that talent. She was born she with did. it. She yeah. did. She did. Eventually, um, as she grew in her career and expanded her horizons, how and why did Mary and the others form United Artists? Well, they'd heard rumors that a number of the studios were going to join forces, and she thought at that point that it would probably mean that there would be only one or two 
studios that, that to negotiate with. So they decided, this group of uh, top actors, that they were going to get together and they would form their own company, an own production company, and that was United Artists that was, they had control, total control out of all, over all their pictures, including distribution, mm -hmm. so they could sort of cut out the middleman. And now, so the the others that formed uh, United Artists, there was there was Mary, uh, Charlie Michael Chaplin, Senior, uh -huh. uh, D. W. Griffith. He had left uh, Biograph by that time too. William S. Hart and Charlie Chaplin. So, and uh, forming United Artists, this would like also guarantee that uh, their own films, whether they were producing or acting in them, that they would eventually get into the theaters. Exactly. Yeah. Now, regarding Mary's personal life, um, how did the marriage of Mary and Douglas Fairbanks Sr. affect their popularity and their careers? Now, they eventually became viewed as the world's first super couple, finding that they were famous the world over. But getting getting to their marriages, uh, getting to their marriage was a little bit uh, roundabout and difficult because they were both originally married to other people. Right, and Mary was very leery of uh, divorcing Owen Moore and and marrying. Douglas Fairbanks, because in those days divorce was really frowned upon, and so she thought she, you know, her fans would no longer uh, flock to her movies if she were sort of a tainted lady. But it didn't turn out that way at all. Indeed, Douglas uh, Fairbanks Sr. and Mary Pickford became Hollywood royalty. Mm -hmm. uh, everywhere they went, they were mobbed by frenzied fans. Uh, so it, it, it turned out to be a good thing. America's sweetheart had married everybody's oh. favorite screen star. That's right. Douglas was famous, yeah. too, because of his swashbuckling roles. And, yes, he was very well-known and very well-loved, too. And that's sort of like because everybody loves a, a love story. Yes. A and theirs was one of the grandest, like when they were, mm -hmm. they were both at the top of their careers, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, after marriage to uh, Douglas Fairbanks Sr., Mary... Uh, married Buddy Rogers, and how do you think that that marriage compared to the the Fairbank Senior one? Like, was one or the other of more benefit to her personally or professionally? Well, I think probably her her marriage to Douglas Fair, Fairbanks was uh, probably helped her most uh, in her profession. They, you know, they formed their own studio, and yeah, they were just internationally famous. But I think her marriage to band leader. Buddy Rogers, who was so much younger than she was, it was sort of, he adored her, he sort of worshipped her, and he supported her in everything she did right up until the end of her life. So I think that was, they were quite different marriages. And they had actually met early on um, in their, in her, in Mary's film career, uh, in, in, in an early silent, I can't remember the name of it off the top oh, of my head. My, uh, my Best Girl. My Best Girl, right. So I'm just wondering if back then either of them had an inkling of what, what might be in their futures. Well, I guess that's when Buddy, he admitted afterwards, that's when he fell in love with her. Oh. It was way back then, in, uh, 1927. How did Mary's humanity express itself during her career? Uh, she cared for her co-stars and even extras. Uh, there was that story of the young uh, girl sitting on the curb outside the studio while Mary was working. I believe the little girl's mother was a, a wardrobe, worked in wardrobe. Or? Yes. And uh, Mary had seen her sitting there for more than one day and, and, and waiting and wondered what was going on and discovered that the mom was uh, employed right there in the, uh, in the studio. And so she went and spoke to Douglas about it. Could he possibly find something for her to do? And so that he, he did. And, and uh, so the little girl was able to, to work with Douglas and uh, not be just sitting around. She wasn't abused in any way, but it just yeah. bothered Mary that this child was sitting there waiting for hours. And, and she ended up with a part in a film. Yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> <laughs> How did Mary come about to start the Motion Picture Relief Fund? Well, she started that because she felt the need to, to that not a, every actor was as well off as she was. And so one day she came into the studio and she, they say she took a hammer and a nail and she nailed a tin can on the wall of the studio and asked people to drop in their loose change. It became the Motion Picture Relief Fund for needy actors. Mm -hmm. And then eventually that expanded to having um, a certain amount deducted from yes, 
paychecks. Yeah, it became a payroll deduction plan. Mm -hmm. And then d did this eventually spread to other studios as well? Yes, yeah. yes it did. And also, although um, Mary ultimately became known as America's sweetheart, she remained a loyal Canadian. What's the story about the new Canadian flag and pick fair? Oh, well, when the, the Maple Leaf came into uh, being as Canada's flag, Mary went to the embassy in La the Canadian embassy in Los Angeles and to ask for a flag because she remained a staunch uh, Canadian citizen. So she ran it up the uh, flagpole at Pick Fair. Now by that time, of course, she was she was not uh, married to Douglas, but she still she remained in that house until the very end with her Canadian flag flying. And was she still a Canadian citizen then, or did she yes, have dual she citizenship? Mm -hmm. She was. Uh, an American citizen by marriage, but she was still a Canadian citizen. So in, in many ways, Mary's drive to succeed as an actress and in business became her legacy to women at that time, and she remains to this day as a fine example and an inspiration to do and be their best personally and professionally. Do you think this cost Mary privately? Uh, she did have a drinking problem at one point. Yes, I think she probably sacrificed a lot, uh, early on especially. She only went to school for maybe a few weeks when they were still living in Toronto, so she had no education. Her mother taught the children what they what she could. So yeah, I think she gave up a lot of things, and then she didn't have a family until she was married to Buddy and they adopted two children. And yes, when it comes to the drinking problem, she finally succumbed to the alcohol alcoholism that you know was a curse of her whole family. And a lot of actors in those days, it just seemed to be an occupational hazard. There must have been a, like a lot of stress, especially for Mary to handle with everything that she was involved in, like United Artists at that time? or Yes, and she, um, she also tried to look after her brother and her sister. They were both actors, but they, they too were heavy drinkers, and Jack Pickford was getting, always getting in one scrape after another. She helped him find work in, in the films, but... Yeah, it, it was a real struggle for her, so I can see it, why it took its toll in the end. Yeah, and you can only do so much. I mean, you can give your family a helping hand, but, you know, it's what they do with their lives afterwards. Like, you can't be your, you know, your brother's keeper forever. No, you can't. Yeah. What was her involvement in co-founding Ampus? I think there were like 30 other members as well. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in 1927. Uh, uh -huh. Her husband, Douglas Fairbanks Sr., was its first president. Mary was one of the founders. And this would eventually set up, like, for the awards, the Academy Awards ceremony in the future? Yes, and... that wasn't the original intention. It was mm -hmm. sort of, you know, Mary called it the United Nations of, of uh, filmmaking and the actors and directors and producers and that, you know, to help talk about the things that were going on. But now the focus seems to be largely the Academy Awards, the Oscars. Right. And Mary won two herself. She won one in 19... 30 for Coquette, her first talking picture, as the first woman act, female actress uh, in a motion picture. And she won a Lifetime Achievement Award much later on, just right. a couple of years before she died. And, and that's the one where they had filmed it at her home, uh, yes. receiving the award. After uh, all you had come to learn about Mary Pickford's life and career, are there any things that especially stood out for you or any preconceptions you had about her that changed? Because you, you came into writing the book like as a, as a blank slate, so you had no preconceived notions about her? Or? No, I didn't. I knew very little about her. So yes, it was a blank slate. That's true. I think the things that really stood out for me were I had had no idea how hard that the life of a family who were doing the barnstorming, you know, riding the rails all across the country, crisscrossing the United States and coming up into Canada. What a hard life that was because so many of these were just one night stands and then they'd have to jump on the train to get to the next spot. And this is the whole family doing it. You know, all that for $20 a week. Yeah, that was really difficult. And then I think too um, when I learned that Mary Pickford had actually been one of the founders of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, that I was, you know, quite impressed about that, too. She, she certainly had this drive to succeed and, and to stretch herself and to, 
to do the best that she could for herself as well and, and her family. Like yeah. th those were tough times that you spoke up and to come from that point in her life and then to what she eventually achieved and became, it's like staggering to think of, of, of her achievements. So um, she deserves a a every recognition I think that she ever received. And she never lost sight of the poverty and, and the struggles that she had as a young girl. Mm -hmm. that was always, she always remembered that. And uh, so this brings us to the, to the conclusion of the Mary Pickford portion of our interview, Peggy. Thank you so much for such a fascinating look into the private and Hollywood life of Canada's sweetheart. Well, thank you very much, Lorraine. Um, I don't think Canada will soon forget Mary Pickford. Uh, she was a trailblazer, wasn't she? Canada's oh, yes. golden girl. Yeah, she'll never be forgotten. No. Bye for now, Peggy. Thank bye you bye. very much once again. Thank you. Bye now. Lorraine and I are glad that you joined us wherever you were listening from in the world, and we hope you enjoyed our first show. The Ultimate Movies broadcast show will be back next month with more to discover about the marvelous world of film. Goodbye for now. See you then.